Oh, good. Welcome everybody to this recording if we're just starting. <laughs> um, I'm just barely into this, won't go back. Um, um, but uh, for Cornet being one example of a, of a network of delivery systems that uh, are, are, in our view, well suited to doing uh, pragmatic research, but many, many, many others, including, of course, uh, the healthcare delivery system at Hopkins. In fact, I would say that if Sam were with us today, I would be on the phone trying to get him to become a Bacori board member. I just, I have no financial or personal conflicts of interest that I'm aware of. And I do want to say that I am the former uh, executive director and don't have a whole lot to do with Pecori these days. I talked to several people in planning this talk just to get my facts straight and they looked at the slides, but um, all the views expressed here are mine and not those of the board uh, of the of Pecori. Now, when Albert was talking to me, he at one point referred to this talk today as a um, post-mortem on my time at Pecori, and I just want to say au contraire that uh, Pecori is more alive than ever. It's just been reauthorized for 10 years. Um, it has a lot of new energy, but most importantly, it has a very energetic, very young, uh, new executive director, Dr. Nikayla Cook, who came to Pecori uh, in the middle of the COVID shutdown. I'm not sure she's ever been to the offices, probably, but uh, you know, beforehand, but uh, not since she started working. She's a cardiologist by training and she's been at the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute for uh, a long time, serving as senior scientific officer and chief of staff uh, at the uh, NHLBI. Uh, she's just, uh, she, you know, she's really hit the ground running, full of energy. She seems to have gotten to know Pecori in, in, in no time flat and um, uh, is really, um, if you haven't met her yet, you should. She's a great, I've always said that I've had three jobs in medicine in, in, in my professional career, and each time I was uh, replaced by somebody much better than me, and she certainly kept up that tradition. So um, today, we're going to, if you will indulge me, we're going to do a little history. I'm going to start with the premise that, uh, and, and prove it to you, that there were widespread expectations that Pecori would focus largely on comparisons of clinical interventions with an emphasis on high cost interventions and, and, and particularly drugs. Um, Pecori gave the, uh, Congress gave the job of topic prioritization and setting the national priorities to the Board of Governors and to Pecori itself. Um, in its authorizing legislation. I'm gonna tell you how that process went and how it uh, helps to account for the portfolio that Pecori has today. Really important, I think underappreciated is the surprising name that Congress gave without apparently a whole lot of thought. They borrowed from the phrase patient-centered care and called Pecori the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And nobody can quite tell me how it came to pass, but they were looking for an innocuous name and it had a profound, profound impact on Pecori's development and research portfolio. Can't be overstated. When it comes to funding clinical research of the kind that was expected, uh, we ran into several repeated problems, challenges, and I'm gonna go through those just as a way of getting your thinking going for what comes in Pecori 2.0. And I'm gonna invite you at the end and certainly Mark and, and Liz and Jody to make comments on Pecori of the future because um, Pecori is after all the stakeholder driven research organization. You as researchers are stakeholders and um, Pecori is most interested in uh, your comments. Um, so setting the stage now, this is uh, some evidence that in fact we were expected to do uh, high cost interventions, especially drugs. So everybody knows Gail Walensky, former head of uh, HICPA, uh, uh, economist, uh, uh, closely linked to uh, CARE and to uh, uh, the, the journal um, um, Health Affairs. So in 2006, she had an article called Developing a Center for Comparative Effectiveness Research, which before eventually became in it. This is what she said, the, uh, the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003, I believe, has renewed interest 
in having better information available on the relative clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness of alternative therapeutic treatments as a strategy to moderate spending. Later on, she said, because of the rapid rise in prescription drug spending earlier in the decade and the political third rail of that pharmaceutical manufacturers have long represented, the interest in good comparative data is especially strong for prescription drugs. A uh, year about the same time, Peter Orzog, who was uh, under the Bush administration, he was the director of the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, when President Obama came in, he named him as the director of the Office of Management and Budget, OMB. And Peter, in a white paper in 2017, said, generating better information about the costs and benefits of different treatment options through research on the comparative effectiveness of these could help reduce healthcare spending without adversely affecting health overall. And um, about the same time, starting in late 2006, an IOM committee was formed um, basically to consider how best to manage the evidence that we have, that is systematic review. So this committee was Hal Sox as its chair and Hal Sox and Barbara McNeil as co-chairs uh, set out to uh, propose a way to manage systematic reviews, uh, to conduct and manage reviews so that people could write guidelines and incorporate evidence into practice. They listed uh, in the very opening pages of, the, of the, what's now a book, um, that their imperatives were driven by constraining healthcare costs, by showing what doesn't work um, so that we quit spending money on it. They also, in, in number five below, uh, suggested that making healthcare coverage decisions for newly available health services was a priority that could be helped by an institute that would uh, conduct and manage systematic reviews. Okay, when we finally get to the legislation in late 2009, 20, early 2010, um, Congress is much more circumspect and says almost not a word about controlling cost. This is the one place in the whole 20 some page document where they mention that. And what they say is one of the prior, one of the factors that you should consider in laying out your national priorities for research is the effect on national expenditures associated with healthcare treatment strategy or healthcare costs. Elsewhere in the document, not a word about costs, except that PCORI was not to fund or conduct cost effectiveness analyses or analyses that used um, dollars per uh, quality adjusted life year as a metric, and for it has not. So I hope that we've um, established that there were in, in prominent circles, uh, an expectation that PCORI would in fact um, go after high priced uh, uh, treatments, new treatments, and maybe particularly pharmaceuticals. Um, so, talk about topic prioritization, which national priorities and topic prioritization, the process by which we actually get to a portfolio of research. Back to this same IOM committee, for the purpose of gathering information from systematic reviews and funding systematic reviews, they proposed that a single agency be designated. It could be an existing agency or there could be a new one created inside or outside government. But its purpose was to carry out a national program for setting priorities for and funding systematic reviews, setting standards for reviews and supporting guideline development by uh, stakeholder organizations. Um, the agency was to be uh, overseen by a board, a clinical effectiveness advisory board appointed by the secretary of HHS. And the program should then appoint an independent standing priority setting advisory committee charged solely with setting priorities and identifying topics for research. Um, that did not happen in the case of um, PCOR, uh, PCORI. In fact, as you'll see, or as you saw, PCORI was told to set the national priorities itself. No mention of, a, of an independent um, body. And the meaning of that is that um, responsibility for 
topic prioritization fell to the full board, the same body that worried about Pecori's functioning and Pecori's political survival in a politically charged time. So Pecori spent about 15 months gathering public input from researchers, patients, other stakeholder groups, a public comment uh, period gathered 474 public comments. These were digested and, and factored into the final report. And in May of 2012, the national priorities were published. And these are what they were. Extremely broad thematic priorities. The assessment of prevention, diagnosis, and treatment options. Now that's the priority where we anticipated we would see all of the head-to-head -head clinical comparisons. The second was improving healthcare systems. The third was communication and dissemination research. And in here would be things like shared decision-making among others. Uh, the fourth was addressing disparities. And uh, the fifth was um, uh, a priority that was dedicated to research methods and also to building research infrastructure. Among the research infrastructure items eventually built was a core net. This um, set of very broad priorities, I think, reflected on the one hand, the board's reluctance to just quickly name a bunch of topics without, in their view, what was sufficient interaction with stakeholders, patients, and other stakeholders. And also, secondly, I think a belief among a number of board members that the research community partnered with patients and other stakeholders would just naturally come up with the hot topics. And you know, maybe that was the better way to go, more of an investigator-initiated approach. Well, five months after these were published, Hal Sox, who chaired not only that IOM committee I've introduced you to, but also the IOM committee that, that generated a list of 100 CER topics that should be taken up quickly, uh, published this in Health Affairs. He said, before you should plan its research agenda strategically so that this research question that CER could answer quickly and decisively. To date, the Institute has not chosen this path. Corey's first research agenda described broad research priorities rather than specific clinical questions. Well, in fact, we uh, did not disagree with this point of view, and we had said in the document that over time, we anticipate that Corey will develop a research portfolio that includes both broad calls for proposals, um, but also uh, contracts targeted uh, contract targeted specifically to high priority items identified from engagement with, with the public, uh, patients, uh, and other, a dialogue with stakeholders, and also consideration of public needs. And these targeted opportunities would focus on specific conditions or diseases, treatment modalities, outcomes, or themes that are cross-cutting. They would be specific topics for research. So um, in this slide, we show in that document, the National Priorities document, we said that about 40% of the fund, overall funding would go to that priority number one, which is where the clinical comparisons, the A versus B type comparisons would predominate. Uh, and then half that to improving health systems and about a quarter of that to addressing health disparities, communication and dissemination research, and then about, um, the remaining 20% through methods and infrastructure. But several years later, what we had uh, been able to commit was uh, somewhat less than 40% to the assessment of prevention, diagnosis, and treatment options, somewhat more for improving health systems, somewhat more for addressing disparities, and a somewhat less for communication. And um, just about exactly what we had planned uh, in the uh, area of infrastructure and methods. Now, we put twice as much money in the announcements for uh, assessment of prevention, diagnosis, and treatment options, but we did not get the double the number of applications. The applications that we got did not fare as well at merit review as the applications for improving health systems and disparities fared. And even the, the projects that we funded under priority number one often were not exactly those old clinical A versus B comparisons that we were expecting. Why not? Well, 
Um, I think I, you can make a great argument that PCORI had a very strong rationale for including health systems, addressing disparities and communications in its priorities. So with respect to improving health systems, we heard from day one when we engaged stakeholders that it's really the system, stupid. Systems uh, are closely linked with disparities. We came to appreciate that very early on, uh, and especially for efforts to eliminate those disparities. Systems are also essential if you want to support or change clinician behavior. Systems control the incentives and the barriers to behavior change. Systems are also important uh, for a number of the kinds of emerging health problems or research needs that clinicians have, such as obesity, opioid overuse, maternal mortality, and COVID-19. And, and PCORI has a substantial funding now in all of those areas. With respect to um, addressing disparities, I don't think you can understate how much happened in the nine years that PCORI was um, uh, during phase one of PCORI's life. Very quickly in the process, as we talked to health, plan, uh, health systems leaders, hospital leaders, they talked to us about the social determinants of health. They were being graded on their outcomes and they were completely uh, aware and, and convinced that their patients had uh, worse uh, social situations and that contributed to things like rehospitalization and just poor outcomes generally. Um, a little bit later, maybe 2015 or 16, we began recognizing, I don't mean for Corey, but I mean medicine in general, began recognize the potential positive role of the community in promoting health. And, and uh, we're going to talk a lot about community health workers today, but that's one manifestation of the strong link between um, uh, clinical medicine and the community. The social justice movement and COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic in this past year have just emphasized this further that uh, there are a lot of determinants of health which we've not traditionally considered clinical. So I'm um, Oh, and lastly, with respect to communication and decision support research, we recognized from the beginning that if we wanted to get behavior change either by physicians or patients, having generated the CER evidence, it was going to take some um, pretty um, innovative um, uh, and not yet discovered approaches in terms of decision support. But I'm very glad that I'm talking today to a school of public health, in fact, the oldest school of public health, because Really what happened, I think, to PCORI in some ways is that uh, we saw a, a more of a coming together of public health and um, clinical medicine than, than we've seen in the 100 years since uh, your institution um, participated in the sort of the separation of clinical medicine and public health, launched schools of public health and uh, made clinical medicine much more related to um, uh, biology. Uh, than uh, we today, I think, believe it needs, it should be. But after about three years, you could see this on our website, and you could see that Pecoria had developed a very diverse set of topics that it had made investments in. I don't know if you, I hope you can see this, but there's little circles appearing around some of these. Any number of these, just on their face, have to do with systems level uh, approaches as opposed to things one would do as a researcher with clinicians or patients one at a time. So uh, yes, systems have a lot to do with uh, clinical care as well as a lot to do with uh, addressing disparities. Now this is really a very interesting slide to me. This is in the original publication of the CER 100 topics. After sitting down and finding 100 good comparative effectiveness questions, they categorized them and they concluded, uh, I was on that committee uh, uh, too, we concluded that 50 out of 100 questions really had major healthcare delivery system implications and 29% had disparities implications. Um, aside from that, uh, that, which reflects substantially PCORI's portfolio, if you look across here, PCORI's portfolio looks quite a bit like the topics that were laid out in the CER portfolio. I think PCORI is a little richer in pediatric and geriatric topics. And I would say that, uh, you know, our critics would say that PCORI's um, agendas, although it may 
have topics in all these categories, they are not the A versus B clinical comparisons, often not. In fact, that's what Congress said uh, in 2016. The Center for American Progress in uh, DC had written a white paper that pretty much said Pokori had missed the boat and was not doing the kinds of uh, high stakes CER that uh, had been anticipated. Um, not long after that, we got a letter from the Democratic, um, 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 a group of Democratic congressional representatives who urged us to strengthen our investment um, in pharma, uh, CER of pharmaceuticals. Um, by prioritizing studies of two or more treatments, we can empower patients and providers to make more informed treatment choices. They cited the growing drug pricing crisis. In um, five months later, we got a letter from a senator who uh, said, a Democratic senator who said almost the same words, just spending on prescription drugs has increased dramatically. Uh, we are encouraged that Corey has invested some in comparative clinical effectiveness research on prescription drugs. And, I would say we definitely did and have. Um, as a nation moves to a system which pays for value, it's critical that all the tools and resources available are used to evaluate the comparative effectiveness of the growing array of medical treatments. So uh, carefully worded documents from both the House and the Senate saying put the focus back on drugs and new other high cost interventions. So um, I hope that that's established that um, Pocori and its Board of Governors somewhat um, broader uh, perspective, but really one tinged with a lot of public health consciousness and that reflects who was on the board, I think. Uh, and um, uh, that's uh, how we uh, began our path toward uh, laying out a set of priorities and an agenda. But now I want to talk a bit about the name because, as I said, the name was not uh, um, the centerpiece of uh, what Congress debated over I mean, it planned this. It was an effort to uh, be a little soft and maybe to attract some Republicans to support the Affordable Care Act and, and the Cory within it. Didn't succeed, but we wound up with a name. When I got to Washington, my first question as I went around the hill uh, talking to people who had been there was how did Pocori get his name? Because I was confused. I thought I was coming east to do this uh, comparative effectiveness research and um, just wondered about what we did with that name and what it meant. Um, Pocori's board didn't wonder for long though. Uh, I don't want you to look so much at the purpose here. But that's from the legislation and it said not a word about engagement of patients or others. Pocori's mission, though, written nine months into Pocori's existence after these members had just met each other, was to help people make informed healthcare decisions and improve healthcare delivery and quality, um, producing and, and promoting research that comes from research guided by patients, caregivers, and the broader healthcare community. That quickly became known as engagement. And engagement, we hired engagement officers before we hired science officers. Uh, and engagement has been a cornerstone of core activities. And, low, and, and we meant engagement not only with patients, but also with clinicians, uh, payers, health systems leaders, the research community, uh, uh, and pharmaceutical industry. Um, uh, everybody is involved in uh, delivering health care and or receiving it. I, I didn't say caregivers, but I you certainly mentioned caregivers is a very important stakeholder group. So in, engagement turned out to be making a difference. Um, patients were really ready. It was very clear that they were ready for this and, and excited about it and, and capable. Clinician organizations, uh, payers and employers also were uh, very interested in, and able to engage. Um, engagement quickly began to look like it enhanced multiple stages in the research process from planning a study to um, uh, look, developing the protocol and the uh, data collection instruments to recruitment, to understanding barriers and, and solving problems around recruitment, to analyzing data, uh, and to uh, disseminating it in the end. Um, researchers, after first talking very ferociously about how much trouble this was going to be, wound up responding by and large very positively to the experience of working with patients and other stakeholders. Um, 
Engagement is now widely practiced um, just about everywhere. The FDA, our industry, all have major engagement uh, activities going on. And the uh, evidence of a positive impact of engagement on health research is growing. Investigators, before investigators began publishing papers about how engagement had affected their study. And this is one from a surgical randomized trial where they had to uh, in recruit parents to, uh, in a trial of uh, African versus antibiotics in children, they had to recruit parents to a separate, uh, uh, a qualitative study. And they were having real trouble until they got involved with their patients. And the patients showed them things they were doing wrong, revised their um, approach to recruitment for this sub-study, and enrollment uh, increased from 65 to 95%. Uh, and increase, increase the rate of completed 30 days of follow-up from 58 to 85%. So these kinds of studies, not really solicited or promoted by Papori, just started proliferating hundreds of them. Um, and pretty soon, about 2014, Papori's um, evaluation um, um, group developed a tool that they put on Papori's website precisely to um, allow you to search the literature for uh, examples of engagement, examples of engagement in health research, evaluations of engagement, systematic reviews and other syntheses of reports on um, engagement methods or the impact of engagement, and frameworks and editorials and other kinds of commentaries on engagement. So I, if you have any interest in learning more about the burgeoning science of engagement in health research, this is a fabulous tool, and I don't think there's any um, uh, You can cut and sort it in any number of ways to get just what you're looking at. For example, the particular disease you're interested in studying. So um, that's, that's kind of the story of um, how Pecori's board got to uh, promoting engagement. This now, I want to go to what Pecori actually funded and how researchers' responses to our funding announcements helped to shape our portfolio. So in 2012, we issued the funding announcements and they were called broad funding announcements. You could apply to study anything as long as you were engaged with appropriate stakeholders and persuaded us that your question was relevant to patients. And over time, uh, by 2018, we've spent about 55% um, of the commitments have been uh, to awards, although that's changing rapidly. Uh, targeted funding announcements were, uh, and those broad announcements were relatively small, about $2 million in direct costs, about $3 million total uh, per project was the max. Targeted funding announcements could be much larger. They varied. Historically, they varied from about $2 million per project to uh, $30 million for one project. These always had a specific topic in mind, and they were developed after intense engagement with um, various stakeholder groups, clinician groups, uh, payers. We often would consult with uh, um, uh, NIH institutes at the NIH, with ARC, with CDC, uh, or, uh, or the FDA, or others in getting the targeted funding announcement right. And um, that the first of those came out in very late 2013. Um, and the third group came out in the, at, toward the end of 2014, and this was already sensing that we were not getting the kind of clinical studies that we really uh, had expected and the others were expecting, we developed this funding announcement called the Pragmatic Clinical Studies Award. These had to be uh, studies, really had to be basically A versus B studies, although uh, certainly uh, systems or disparities topics could be introduced here. Uh, but they were much more obviously about clinical topics. Uh, and for these, you could get up to 10 million in direct costs 15 million total. So by the end of 2018, 55% of our commitments were to these specific topics uh, that you see in 2013 in, uh, uh, in the targeted funding announcements, in the pragmatic announcements. And that is, I think, by the, if I had it through 2019, it would be even more skewed. The broads would represent a smaller amount of the total, but that's just as we have planned back in 2013 and evidence of our concern about getting more clinical topics. Okay, um, back to the name for a minute. Patient-centered outcomes research was not a term before we got our name, but 
but patient-centered care had been around for almost two decades. And what it meant was that um, clinical care should show respect for patients' values, their preferences, and express needs, shared decision-making, if you will. That care should be coordinated and integrated. That information and communication and education were essential. That physical comfort and emotional support um, were very important parts of patient-centered care uh, and part of the role of clinicians. And involvement of family and friends. The Picker Institute and the Institute of Medicine uh, have stated that the patient experience and patient-centered care is one of the central components of healthcare quality, and there are positive associations between a good patient experience, patient safety, and clinical effectiveness. So um, patient-centered care was a very um, um, vital and um, active area of uh, research and practice change. Uh, when Pocori, with its name, Patient Center Outcomes Research Institute, uh, came into view. This shows what we funded by the end of, um, uh, by mid-2014, so two full years of funding. You'll see that there were large numbers of studies, uh, all from the broad portfolio on topics like care transitions, community health workers, health coaching, integrated collaborative care, palliative and end-of-life care, patient navigators, self-management of disease, shared decision-making, and telemedicines. All of these are very closely related to the concept of patient-centered care. Now, there had never been anything in the legislation that told us to fund studies about patient-centered care. We had not put anything in our funding announcements about patient-centered care uh, or studies of patient-centered care, but this is what we got. The research community partnered with patients, uh, came up with hundreds of good ideas for studies that really asked questions about whether patient-centered care uh, could improve patient outcomes. Before we leave the um, area of the broad funding announcements, though, I want to say uh, another interesting thing about them um, is that uh, some of them had a profound impact. They were relatively small studies. They had a profound impact. The first one here that I show you is a very nicely done randomized clinical trial of 450 patients, three arms, um, to see if finger sticks make a difference in type 2 diabetes uh, for patients not on insulin. And they did not. There was no difference in A1C levels or quality of life uh, a year after starting people on either very intensive self-monitoring of blood glucose or standard self-monitoring of blood glucose compared to not using SMBG at all. This had a profound impact. Uh, it's been dis being disseminated. Uh, Medicare took uh, prompt notice of it. It actually could save several billion dollars a year if, uh, if this were uh, reduced uh, and uh, was no longer done for that subgroup of diabetes patients. Now, another one was a large, very large observational study. No, I'm sorry, no, this was, yeah, this was a very large observational study that showed that when kids leave the hospital after a serious infection, they do just as well at home on all antibiotics as on the most ex uh, more expensive and more troublesome and burdensome and actually somewhat risky Join the meeting. use of um, intravenous antibiotics. So another relatively small study, observational effect, had a huge impact on changing clinical guidelines uh, away from sending kids home on IVs with nurses and splints on their arms. Uh, and it reduced um, the cost, obviously, uh, of delivering the care, but it also reduced complications that led kids to come back to the ER and hospital. The third one was the introduction of a shared decision-making questionnaire tool in the emergency room for people with chest pain that had very low likelihood of having coronary artery disease. It had been, uh, EMI had been ruled out, and the question was, do you stay in the hospital or do you go home and come back and get worked up as an outpatient? And this uh, shared decision-making tool doubled the fraction of people who went home from about 40% to about 70% um, of the um, patients who uh, got told that they were at low risk 
but maybe you should consider staying all night and paying three times as much for your treadmill stress test and possibly angiogram the next day. Um, uh, double the number decided to go home and have it done at a third the cost as an outpatient. Um, the fourth study, and we have any number of studies of community health workers, um, uh, was done in Philadelphia with a veterans and a community clinic uh, practice practices and found that community health worker program could improve care quality and reduce hospitalizations in urban veterans and other patients, I need to add, who had chronic illness. Uh, so uh, improved outcomes uh, as well, uh, clinical outcomes as well as reduced costs. And another nice one, and this one is from um, your institution, uh, Dr. Elliot Holt. Um, both nurse and patient, patient education can reduce failures to launch and uh, initiate anticoagulant therapy after it's been prescribed in hospitalized patients. So nurse education and particularly patient education uh, markedly reduced the failures to get anticoagulants started. Study has been now uh, funded uh, twice now uh, for larger and larger dissemination efforts. We really think it's uh, uh, a very impactful way to uh, get improve the quality of care. But the bottom line here is that when you start with engaging patients and asking about patient-centered uh, questions, sometimes you get not only improved clinical outcomes, but it actually is a way to reduce the, uh, the costs of care. So patients are not necessarily drawn to the most costly therapies. Uh, they raise questions about it and, and studies based on their curiosities can lead to cost savings. So now I'm going to switch to that second category, the targeted announcements, and show you quick examples of two. This was one that was um, developed by our disparities program under the disparities priority. Two studies in the area of improving asthma outcomes for African Americans and Latinos. Um, they focused on um, uh, comparing interventions to improve patient and cl clinician adherence to um, uh, national guidelines to the, on including studies that use patient-centered outcomes tailored to the needs of specific individuals and populations. And they incorporate interventions at the community, home, and health system levels uh, in assessing combinations of patient education tools, home environment interventions, asthma medications, and team-based approaches. You see the nice geographic spread of studies. Um, community health workers, again, five, six studies examine the role of community health workers in doing home assessments and coaching. Uh, and five of those six studies showed that patient assessments, I mean, that community health workers improved patient outcomes in both children and adults, African American and Latino, with. Um, uh, with asthma. All environmental assessments were also shown to be effective in at least two studies. However, these were done basically by the community health workers, and so it's a little bit difficult to ease out the impact of community health workers overall from the environmental assessments per se. Um, and interestingly, uh, in two studies, patients. Um, Wait a minute, let's see. Uh, I want to talk about patient tools first. Um, patient tools, usually computer, uh, internet-based, uh, computerized, are shown to be helpful, uh, but they are also shown that in low-income urban communities, internet access was still a problem, so their effectiveness was less, actually, in uh, lower-income patients. And finally, two studies used different approaches to studying patient adjustment of their inhaled steroids versus fixed provider specified doses. And in each case, um, outcomes were maintained if patients adjusted their steroids and used them on an as needed basis. And the steroid use was greatly reduced in both. So greatly reduced you know, the uh, medications with significant adverse effects with outcomes. So very nice examples of there, there really is that nice, uh, more what you think of as the clinical uh, comparative effectiveness studies. And um, this is the other end of the extreme. This is the $30 million study that PCORI funded. This was actually a contract to, to NIA uh, at the NHL, at the NIH. And um, we conducted this study together, but it was really managed through, completed and funded and managed through NIA. 
Uh, and it was a very pragmatic study to see if practice based nurses could deliver risk assessment, individualized pre prevention plans, telephone or in person coaching, and referrals, community resources, resources, collaborating with their PCPs to reduce falls in high risk elderly patients. So, this was a cluster randomized trial, 84 primary care settings, 10 health systems, more than 5,000 patients. Uh, age 70 and above with increased risk for falls. Um, they hypothesized a 20% reduction in both adjudicated falls and patient reported falls. Uh, the intervention failed to meet pre-specified levels in falls or patient reported falls, although the patient reported was nominally significant, but uh, didn't uh, not a clinically uh, um, significant impact. And the authors uh, and the editorial that went with it uh, hypothesized, suggested that reasons for failure to find a greater effect were probably um, adherence was not uh, as great uh, to the behavior change and, and patients didn't always select the most important behaviors to change. Other aspects of the plan maybe were not intensive enough and transportation and financial barriers to these community resources created problems. So here's a case of a pragmatic study that maybe got too pragmatic too quick or at least to scale back too quickly. Uh, and um, I think Bacori is now looking at uh, how I can follow up on this, uh, given that all the interventions in this uh, sort of multi-component intervention were evidence-based in the first place. Now I wanna just show you one example of a pragmatic clinical study. This is a randomized trial comparing antibiotics with appendectomy for appendicitis. So just the kind of a versus B comparison that people might have expected. Um, this was an individual level, non-inferiority pragmatic trial conducted in a, in a research ready hospital network, 25 uh, hospitals. 1,552 patients randomized. Um, uh, they had to have uncomplicated appendicitis and they had um, uh, imaging um, at the time of uh, diagnosis. Uh, they were randomized to either appendectomy, immediate appendectomy, or uh, initial antibiotics. This was three times larger than the largest previous study. Uh, at the end of um, at the end of 30 days post presentation, there were no differences in quality of life. Patients in the antibiotic group returned to work three days sooner on average. 29% in the antibiotic group. Um, required an appendectomy by 90 days. So uh, nearly a third of patients in the antibiotic group did get surgery eventually. Very interesting, we always tell our applicants to uh, look for treatment heterogeneity, they did, and they found it. Um, uh, the identification of an appendical lift, uh, which is a hardened stool impacted into the appendix on the entry imaging study, CT scanner ultrasound, predicted the need for surgery in the antibiotics group. 41% uh, if you had an appendical lift, 25% if you didn't, and a much higher risk of complications, 20.2% uh, risk of complications on antibiotics in the um, uh, group with an appendical lift, and only 3.6% complication rate, exactly the same as surgery in the, uh, in the uh, group with how Lift. So for patients without an appendical lift at presentation, antibiotics have the same complication rates of surgery, similar quality of life at 30 days, a 25% chance of needing surgery within 90 days, and quicker return to work. So I think you'd agree that this is the rich kind of information that patients need, and I'm sure that you'd agree that some patients seeing this would opt for immediate surgery, and others would probably take uh, uh, the antibiotics. But uh, as nice as this study is, as much of a proof of concept as it is, uh, it's not um, uh, the same story for many of the other 45 pragmatic clinical studies that have been funded. Many of them have very exciting research questions, um, but we're going to talk a little bit uh, in just a minute about what happened to them. Uh, in fact, we're going to do it now. Um, a number of problems have been encountered. They've been encountered recently repeatedly when funding pragmatic comparisons of more clinical options, especially randomized trials, especially new treatments. So here's a list of concerns. 
Um, and you bear in mind that this, these are concerns we ran into after the study session had reviewed and decided to fund, and after PCORI staff and board had decided to fund these relatively large study studies. Many of them still ran into disinterest in randomization among patients, clinicians, and delivery systems. Uh, some of it was related to equipoise, other was probably just related to hassle. But um, uh, certainly there were cases where patients or clinicians did not want to participate in the trial because they thought they knew the answer. It was difficult in planning these studies even to get, uh, to get agreements over appropriate comparators, outcomes, and study populations. Um, system readiness, there is a big difference between systems who are willing to be listed as a host for a pragmatic trial and systems that are genuinely supportive and excited by the trial and willing to promote recruitment, eliminate barriers, and uh, allow or facilitate data collection. This was an, something unanticipated in the legislation. We ran into it quickly. The cost of new therapies, if, if, a, if a new treatment is not yet approved by payers, Medicare or health plans, Corey uh, is not allowed to pay for medical care in the legislation. So who's gonna pay for it? And typically payers had not worked, turned out not to be that interested in paying for it, neither were manufacturers. So we have uh, several studies where getting um, someone to pay for elements of the intervention wound up taking a long time, if, if ever, you know, if they ever got to that point. Um, the long time requirements are just a, a, a Eddie, well, problem with pragmatic trials uh, of new therapies in general because trials still take four years or longer for approval, recruitment, and follow up, and the answers are needed right now. So that's just a problem that decreased the enthusiasm for some trial topics. And the last one is that rapidly changing information and research questions about uh, whether new treatments are really going to stick around and be the predominant treatments five years from now when this study comes out, will the research questions really be relevant five years from now? And quickly, uh, four clinical studies that we tried to get launched and we simply couldn't, which is maybe a, another part of the reason we don't have more clinical head to head studies in our portfolio than we do. For example, so we wanted from day one to do a study of back surgery versus multi-component non-surgical treatment. We spent a couple of years discussing with various stakeholders, particularly various groups of clinicians, different specialties, um, what the right comparator was and who the right study population was and where you actually intervened on the patients to randomize. Once we got a study idea together and, and issued a funding announcement, we found it very difficult to find health systems or payers who were willing to cover the costs of the state-of-the-art non-surgical care that stakeholders had agreed to be the comparator. So this study never got funded despite being posted twice. Um, a very exciting topic was the appearance of these new second-line hypoglycemic agents, um, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors and the uh, um, uh, GLP-1 um, agonists. And um, both of these had evidence that they could reduce cardiovascular disease events, the most common complications in type 2 diabetes. We put a lot of effort, worked closely with both the American Diabetes Association, uh, the NIDDK, and the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute to try to get a trial off the ground. It would have to have hard incomes. It would be very expensive. And we could not eventually ultimately persuade the Corey's board that there was a durable comparison question that would still be of interest five years from now when this study, under the best of circumstances, uh, reported out. So that interesting study did not get funded, and we ultimately were now uh, hoping to fund an observational study of the same type that had a, a, a targeted funding announcement in that area. The third one was um, as the PCSK9s, the injectable PCSK9s came out for uh, cholesterol lowering in, in uh, resistant patients. There was a grave concern among payers that PCSP9 would now be promoted much more broadly because they are so amazingly effective at dropping um, LDLC levels. Uh, but in talking with stakeholders, payers on the one hand and manufacturers on the other, we could not even uh, uh, reach agreement on what uh, the risk was, or what the risk group, the target group for the study should be. 
um, patients with moderate risk, but um, uh, the pharmaceutical companies follow the traditional line of wanting smaller studies in very high risk patients. The payers wanted studies much more broadly, like looking like the group to whom the, uh, the drugs would eventually be recommended. And we could not get to any agreement on that. And eventually, given the low use of PCSK9s, interest waned even on the part of payers in uh, doing a study. And the last one was a memorable event. As the new antivirals came out in 2014, hepatitis C, we wanted to do a study, or we proposed the idea of a study of immediate treatment versus watchful active surveillance uh, on the basis that we knew that 70% of patients would go through their lives and never progress to any level of cirrhosis or liver failure. Patients and clinicians were um, up in arms. They were outraged. They were strongly opposed to a trial that would randomize patients to not getting immediate treatment. And I think the clinicians were even more uh, vocal than the patients, but the patients were very vocal too. Uh, there was just not agreement on equipoise, so that study never got off the ground. So I hope that these four examples give you a sense of you know, the kinds of challenges of applying CER to those questions. So uh, in this closing little segment, uh, looking ahead to PCORI 2.0, um, I'm not any longer at PCORI, so a lot of this is you know, my thoughts, uh, not necessarily what's going to PCORI is going to do, but I can point to a number of issues that suggest that PCORI is still focused on making its research portfolio even more clinically relevant. I'm going to talk in the next slide about placer awards, which is a new large funding announcement um, uh, to attract these kinds of studies. I talk about a, a congressional change in the reauthorization le legislation that encourages PCORI to fund comparisons of the cost of care, whereas before they were very old to that notion. Talk a little bit about the role of PCORnet uh, and other research ready systems networks um, uh, for um, conducting clinical, genuine clinical research without the barriers that many of the barriers we've run into. Um, I, I wanna say something about systematic reviews. PCORI began funding systematic reviews of various types, both um, um, uh, traditional systematic reviews, but also horizon scans and, and uh, topic briefs about a year ago now. And its investment has increased each year and I think it will continue to increase Systematic reviews are important for stakeholders. They need the, the information. And um, they're also an additional means of identifying key pragmatic clinical research questions that need to be answered. And the second area is the area of dissemination and implementation. I am, have been very impressed at PCORI's board. It is very committed to spending a portion of its allocations on dissemination and implementation projects. The legislation actually says that PCORI will be evaluated on its the extent to which it changes practice. And everybody recognizes that without dissemination and particularly implementation projects, that's not gonna happen. So we have a very nice and growing portfolio of dissemination and implementation projects, mostly targeted to studies that PCORI funded that were successful and, and now deserve in the judgment of the review panel to be disseminated. This is that new funding mechanism. It's called PLACER, Phase Large Awards for Comparative Effectiveness Research. So these are the, some of the largest awards that we propose to be some of the largest awards PCORI's ever given. There will be a feasibility phase, and this is the novel part of where many of the wrinkles and problems that turned out to, to uh, uh, trouble the pragmatic clinical studies and some of the um, target studies as well um, will be addressed during the feasibility phase. And only after the feasibility phase will it be decided with certainty that the um, full-scale phase, which, uh, so $2 million in the uh, feasibility phase, 20 in the um, uh, old phase, and $2 million total, must address a high burden, high impact health topic, must be a randomized controlled pragmatic trial, must be set in real world settings, must feature strong engagement. And this means you'd better have the right, you better have patient, uh, you better have pair, uh, payers, you better have the right patient organizations fully involved in these studies. Um, you have to have an independent data coordinating center, and the transition to full scale is a decision made by PCORI after the pilot phase, but it does not require a second full application. So these place awards, the first one is out now. It's too late to uh, apply, or it's almost, I think it's too late to apply. It's too late to submit a letter of application, but these will be periodic 
going forward. And he's really something for you as researchers to be thinking about your chance to really do that big clinical study that you think is usually important. Um, the emphasis on costs uh, in the legislation reflects a real turnabout by the um, Congress. Bipartisan interest now in the cost of healthcare. So they said, in addition to the relative health outcomes, clinical effectiveness, um, clinical and patient-centered outcomes should include the potential burdens and economic impacts of the utilization of medical treatments, items, and services on different stakeholders. So you can read their health systems, payers, and uh, as well as on patients. So that's a real new aspect of our uh, authorization. We have a, um, a principles of measuring the full scope of outcomes, that is measuring cost outcomes, on our website right now, and um, uh, the public comment period is open for another two weeks, so I'll, I'll mention that again in a second. A few words about um, PCORnet. As you know, we built PCORnet to establish a network of systems that could conduct pregnancy trials. The first trial was a 15,000-person trial in 40 centers called um, Adaptable, which was a study of uh, baby aspirin versus an adult aspirin in patients at high risk for recurrent cardiovascular disease. Uh, this study was done on a relative shoestring. It was done almost on time. They had some trouble, real troubles getting started, but they solved those barriers and rapidly recruited up to 15,000 patients so that they're concluding almost on time. Results will be reported out in uh, early 2021. And that, I think, was a key reason that they competed successfully for the NIA um, trial, National Institute of Aging trial, called, which they call preventable now, which is the question of whether a moderate intensity statin in persons 75 years of old, old and older without heart disease can prevent dementia and whether it can prolong disability-free survival in patients 75 years and above. So they're using uh, electronic uh, data queries to identify the cohort. In intense engagement has been going on. Uh, they are now recruiting, recruitment is open, um, using e-consent, online data collection, direct to participant drug shipments and in-home visits. So totally pragmatic um, study design um, with health systems and their data uh, providing a, a lot of the data collection. When the COVID Here. When COVID hit uh, earlier this year, Corey's board turned to uh, the Cornet for quick help in getting studies underway. Cornet retooled its common data model so that they could do um, almost daily reporting of cases. They built a cohort uh, of 17,000 plus health workers and um, in all kinds of healthcare delivery settings people who would be at risk for uh, increased risk for contracting COVID. In April of 2020, they launched a study, a trial of uh, does hydroxychloroquine protect healthcare record workers against infection with COVID. 1,356 patients have been randomized to date. I can't actually tell you uh, what, how, whether this study is gonna go on and continue recruiting on. I believe my impression is that it will, but it's already quite large. Uh, and two other trials are planned, one uh, in the fall of um, 2020, one on uh, um, vaccines, the short and long-term safety of vaccines, and one on um, vaccine hesitancy. So um, this is a very good time for you as stakeholders to get involved in recording. Uh, they are launching a, a revisit of the national priorities and the uh, research agenda. There is a public comment period open now through November 13th this year. You can find it on the website. You can read their principles for the consideration of the full range of outcomes, including cost data, and comment on that. Uh, comments on their revised national priorities will, take, uh, will be open in early spring of 2021, and comments uh, on their revised research agenda later in 2021. You can serve as merit reviewers. This is a distinctive experience experience distinct from your experiences on NIH uh, study sections, art study sections, and one that people uh, claim to enjoy a lot and, and believe really works. Uh, you can consider volunteering. Once a year, they solicit for their variety of advisory panels. Consider applying for that. And certainly, please 
uh, uh, watch the website and apply for funding. There will be broads, I'm sure. There are these placers, and there will always be uh, new targeted uh, funding announcements. And so with this, I want to uh, turn over to the panel and just maybe pose a couple questions. Do you, to what extent did Pocori miss the boat, if at all, by underfunding in the areas of traditional clinical research in Pocori 1.0? And conversely, are system issues and issues of social determinants of health and health equity actually the key clinical questions in the U.S.? So do we get it exactly right? Is this what clinical medicine uh, in the early 20th century should be about as we sort of begin to bring uh, public health and clinical medicine back together? And what can PCORI do to be even more useful to decision makers, which is health plans, Medicare and Medicaid? So uh, that is it. And let's see, I'll stop sharing the slides, Howard, and turn it back to you. That was uh, comprehensive and answered a lot of my questions and really interesting. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we are going to get a chance now to get some reactions um, <clears throat> from, uh, from three speakers who I will, will introduce briefly now. Um, and each of them is, <clears throat> is going to, to comment. And then we are going to, in the time that we have remaining, we're going to be able to field a few questions, I think, from the audience. <clears throat> the, our first will be Mark Halfand who um, is uh, well known in, in um, circles related to comparative effectiveness research. He's professor of medicine <clears throat> at Oregon Health Sciences University. He's a VA physician. Um, and uh, he has led several programs in research synthesis, uh, health experiences research, scientific communication. Um, he has done a lot of drug effectiveness review for Medicaid. He was the editor of Medical Decision Making. Um, and he has been involved with PCORI since the very beginning. He was an original member of the methodology committee. Our second presenter is going to be Jody Siegel, um, faculty here in HPM and co-director of our Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research, also the co-director of drug safety and effectiveness. Um, she uh, is an expert in comparative effectiveness research and also pharmacoepidemiology. And she's very interested in developing methods for using observational data. Um, and uh, more recently on the problem of overuse. And then finally, Liz Stewart is also here. She's Bloomberg Professor of American Health and Associate Dean for Education. Um, she has uh, appointments in mental health, biostatistics, and HPM. Uh, she is a trained as a statistician, is really interested in causal inference um, in public health and educational interventions. And she was the uh, inaugural chair of the PCORI Clinical Trials Advisory Panel. So um, the, all of these three have been intimately involved in PCORI are real experts in their areas. And um, can we start with Mark? Can you uh, give us your thoughts for so sort of 10 minutes or, or even a little less? Mark. Did we lose Mark? Mark, are you, can you? Um, uh, I think you're on mute. Mark, take it away. He's not in the participant list anymore, Albert. Hello. Yeah. Hello. There's his photo, yeah. Message for the vehicle yeah. owner. Your vehicle has been flat. Uh-oh. Um, we don't want you to drive and speak, Mark. Why don't I go next while we're looking for him, shall oh. we? Mark's here. I'm going to unmute him. Mark, are you on mute? Oh. Yeah. Um, You're good now. Um, Stop muting yourself. <laughs> Mark, you're muted again. 
All right. Yeah. I, I somehow I lost the connection right at the moment. So um, should I go ahead? I didn't hear if you introduced me, but I can go ahead. I, I, you had a, a, a florid and complimentary introduction as appropriate. Um, just some reactions. Yeah, I saw the uh, the questions that that Joe put up at the end. I just I just would uh, and the first question whether we missed the boat on um, <clears throat> on not doing traditional CER. I, I think I could respond to that. Um, but uh, you know, before I do, I just wanted to uh, say you know I I was a big fan of of Joe's for many years, working on the preventive task force, of course, and. Uh, um, the work that he, he did that contributed, especially the uh, case control study we all talk about. Um, my introduction to Congress and to, um, you know, talking with the Senate and Senate staff and, and congressional staff was with CER before the bill was passed. <clears throat> Apparently, I was enough of an expert to go up there and talk. And I was talking with, I'd say, the lead person, a staffer for, uh, for the finance uh, uh, committee. Um, and she was explaining to me how PCORI would all look in the legislation. And I said, hmm, maybe I should be executive director. And she said, no, nah, we need someone like Joe Selby. You should be on the methodology committee. So I, I think she, <laughs> she had the, she certainly had the right uh, insight into that, uh, into that staffing issue. Um, I think there's a couple reasons. So uh, as far as whether PCORI missed the boat, I, I think it's a partial yes um, and, and overall a, a, a no because, um, and, and I'll get to why it's a no, but the partial yes um, is that, uh, you know, on one level, um, uh, if you had a better strategy than doing the traditional CER right out of the gate, if it led to better success, basically a higher success rate for the projects, then I'd be open to say, sure, that turn, it was much better to do something else. I, I think what Joe, when Joe is describing the successful studies, the real success stories, those demonstrate the impact that an apparently uninspiring head-to-head -head study can do. I mean, you know, um, diabetes, um, uh, a lot of investigators would think it's not that exciting to look at uh, glucose monitoring versus not glucose monitoring in type two. Um, but the studies he did were traditional, he talked about the successes were traditional CER. And those successes could have come um, earlier. I think Picori should have sought early victories on the comparative effectiveness um, side from using things on the list of 100 priorities or, or, or others uh, comparable to it. I think that those kinds of studies would have, you know, laid a path for how you do successful research. And I think what ended up happening instead is that while those in some ways rose to the top of the, of, of the pack, there was a lot of other stuff that wasn't as successful. And so it would have been good. I think that after two, three, four years, the board was complaining a lot, my impression about, you know, why don't we have a big moonshot and do something, you know, really great and really move the needle. And instead, I always thought they should do some little things. There was a whole body of, for example, of post-marketing commitments from pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, from the FDA that had never been fulfilled and probably never would be and which are important ingredients in comparative effectiveness, even if they're not comparative, even if it's just a registry study of an intervention or two, you know, the information gap was, was important enough to judge which ones work best for whom. It was important enough for the FDA to cite it. So I think there was some real low hanging fruit that would have been good to pick at that time. Um, the bigger reason to do a traditional, uh, what we call a traditional CER now, um, was the theory behind it. And I think one of the things that happened with the change in the title of the legislation that, <clears throat> that, that Joe mentioned, it had previously been called CER when Baucus and Conrad introduced it in 2008, 
by the time it was in the Affordable Care Act, it had, had this other title. But I think one of the things that was lost was that there was a theory behind using CER and using it to improve decision-making to inform decisions and so on. And I think if I can go back to DERP for a minute, which we did in the early 2000s, um, uh, their theory was very clear there. Our goal was not to get the government to do comparative effectiveness. Our goal was to get pharmaceutical companies, device companies, clinical entities to do them. And, and the reason was that, you know, essentially, if you take a simple situation of a drug class of eight statins or whatever, you know, what drove the market was marketing and beliefs and expectations on the part of clinicians and not the evidence. And so when DERP started to do uh, comparative effectiveness reviews of drug classes and later ARC expanded that after the MMA to, to more comparative effectiveness um, systematic reviews, you know, we learned that we had little idea from the clinical studies out there whether one or another treatment was better or for whom. And the literature signals, I mean, when there was a signal about a potential harm that wasn't realized, there was very little effort to address it in the literature. It could take 10 years to find out that certain kinds of hip implants were, were breaking apart. Nobody was paying that much attention in a registry or other um, monitoring uh, sense. And that these things didn't matter when it came to sales. Um, they were fueled, as I said, by expectations, by, by by marketing and expectations. And so the whole goal was to make the evidence, make evidence of superiority for some or all of the patients, um, be what made you do well in the marketplace, made what your intervention, your surgery, your device, whatever, rise to the top, not these other factors. Because if that were the case, then the company would have a motivation to do those kind of head-to-head -head studies. They had no motivation whatsoever and investigated initiative research, initiated research, and most of the funding agencies didn't really have much interest either. So the other part of the theory <clears throat> was that, um, well, I think something Joe referred to in, in talking about the panels at PCORI and sometimes they would fail to agree and to me, the, that part of the theory before PCORI was in existence, and it disappeared right after, as far as I could tell, but the theory, I think Sean Tunis is representative of this viewpoint in, the, in, the, in that decade, um, was that they don't get together to agree, they get together to agree to disagree, or to put it more precisely, I guess, they get together to, dis, to say, uh, this is why I think this is better, and others say, this is why I don't, or this is why I think that is better. And they agree that a study could resolve that and they get together and they back that study. And so they don't come to a consensus. It's actually a way of getting multiple stakeholders to agree that evidence, the new study is, gonna, is going to address the problem. Um, and in order to do that, um, you know, you have to have certain conditions. One of them is the market condition. If it isn't going to do anybody any good in, in, in the marketplace um, uh, to agree to such a study, they're not going to do it. And, and that gets into the last part of this that, that really is the rest of the theory, if you will. In, in DERP, at least in, in, in the state of Oregon, what we were doing was tied directly to the policy making and finance side of Medicaid. Um, there were, that is a research organization doing review comparative effectiveness could not make the market change. What could make the market change was state Medicaid in, in Oregon and, and uh, later in other states saying, yeah, that's what's gonna matter to us. We're, we're gonna really go for the ones with the best evidence. And so if you produce the best evidence, That'll be, that'll be our choice. And so we don't have that in PCORI. We've never had any tie at all. In a sense, you know, PCORI in a, in a broad sense with sort of the language that people used in press conferences about the legislation, about the ACA, there was some connection with the rest of the ACA, but the transformation of making this kind of comparative effectiveness and informing decisions 
be part of how healthcare is funded or, <clears throat> or, or how, um, it, you know, uh, 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 payers and, and, um, uh, and, and uh, health plans benefit from PCORI wasn't built in. And so I guess what I'm getting at here is that when PCORI went in the direction it did instead of the traditional CER, that's, that's the boat they missed. The boat that they missed was to, to do things that would create that link with payers in the health system that would say, yes, we on our side are now helping to make that a reality, that that evidence counts. And physicians, patients, others might also do that. That was sort of lost because PCORI went in a different direction. And I think these early victories in connection, making, make, strengthening those connections to the payment and clinical sides um, would have been better if they did a, a modicum of more well-defined small CER. Now, all that said, the boat had already started to sink. This was definitely, you know, 2000 stuff, not 2010, not that decade. This thing about drug classes and comparative effectiveness of different devices that are competing with each other uh, was not where the money is anymore with biologics and with innovative new treatments that were mostly one-offs. There and now, the question went much more to, are there gaps in the evidence that reduce the potential value and therefore should reduce the price for these interven interventions? And comparing them to other things, um, you know, I mean, just look at the hepatitis C story that, that, uh, that Joe told. There wasn't even any comparison comparator drug to, to compare it to. No one was going to compare it to interferon. This was all new stuff. And so the questions changed from that traditional mod model. But I think if PCORI had gone the other way, taking the 100 questions focused on traditional CER, built themselves into that, they'd have been obsolete in five years. And so that's the silver lining of not following the traditional CER approach. So, Mark, um, in the interest of time, um, uh, I'm actually transfixed by what you're saying, but um, uh, if you could, uh, I don't know if that was your conclusion, if you could come to the conclusion, we'll get to Dr. Siegel. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I, I probably wasted a minute on the technical problems and another minute with my story. So it wasn't my conclusion, but, but I, think, I think that, um, you know, basically you can't go back. I think the pragmatic trials and some element of the old fashioned CER is right. But what I really did wanna say as a conclusion is that there's always been this misconception that comparative effectiveness means head to head trials and or head to head observational studies. That's not what it really should mean. What it should mean is that we think about what variable, what parameter or factor do we need to know about? In, in decision talk, that would be the sensitive variable. What do we need to know about to know if A is better than B for certain people? So, you know, this goes back to uh, what John Tunis did, what Earl Steinberg did, where the agree to disagree, take, take the early cataract versus delayed cataract question, you know, it turns out that you could pretty much answer you could pretty much resolve the difference between people who wanted to operate on cataracts at the first sign of a cataract and people who wanted to wait a year to see if it developed, you know, with one answer, what proportion of the people who you wait on develop worse enough, have enough progression of disease that they drop golf, they drop golfing, they drop whatever, uh, they drop golf, they drop, drop, drop driving, they never recover those things when you fix the cataract at that point because they've already given up stuff. You could answer it another way, in, in other words, just by observing what happened in the conservative places that didn't do early operations. People essentially agreed that if we knew that, the, the clinical theory of early operation would either be strengthened or weakened enough that you don't need a trial. And I think this is what's lost. This is a way of going forward that, that PCORI's never paid attention to, that you can get a lot of mileage out of all of that interaction with stakeholders 
if you think from the framework of what would help us stop, let's agree to disagree on some parameter, not have to mount a giant trial. I'm all for the giant pragmatic trials, but I think that small lesson has been lost and I would say they should recover that. All right, Mark, thank you very much. Uh, you've given us actually a lot to, uh, to think about. Um, I am gonna go ahead to Jody, um, who, uh, who has slides. Go ahead, Jody. Just very briefly, very briefly. Okay, so I'm, I'm speaking, uh, of course, from the perspective of a, a comparative effectiveness researcher. Uh, so really three, ma three main points. So, oops, here we go. So when, when PCORI was first authorized, of course, my first thought is, oh no, what will happen to comparative effectiveness research as we knew it? So remember, we were all, all invigorated by American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2008, and there was a ton of money for CER, a billion dollars for CER. Carolyn Clancy, director of ARC, testified before Congress in 2009, basically on behalf of CER. ARC's Decide Network was, was in full bloom, uh, gathering new knowledge and information about treatments and conducting studies on outcomes, effectiveness, safety of medical treatments. Uh, that was founded in 2005. And similarly, at the same time, the CTSAs funded by NIH were focused on CER. There is a CER key function committee established in 2009, first led by Harry Selkler. And then I became co-chair the next year with Lisa Simpson, now CEO of Academy Health. In that role, I led uh, the conference in the paper that set out key competencies for researchers conducting CER. And then PCORI was authorized. And much of the CER funding then became concentrated uh, within PCORI ARC became much less focused on CER, much more focused on implementation science, implementation science research, late phase translational research. The CTSAs on the other hand became more focused on earlier phase translation, on big data, on trial infrastructure. I know that Mark authored a paper on behalf of the CTSAs describing the goal of advancing methods for CER and, and how PCORI should work to make this happen. So concentrating CER within PCORI, I'll say was maybe, maybe right, because there isn't really a way to know how the funding and how the research trajectories would have gone of ARC and of NIH and what their successes would have been had PCORI not been established, uh, the counterfactual. <laughs> that was for Liz's benefit. Um, so I think, I, I think we don't know, and I think this was probably, probably right, but, but we don't know. The second point is, oh, patients really should be the primary stakeholder. So I'll admit that um, I always thought patient engagement was sort of the polite thing to do, but, but not vital. But now I, I really feel like uh, PCORI has convinced us all that patient engagement actually is vital. And I think I've learned that most from my colleague here, Bing Bingham in rheumatology, really impressing upon me that it would be pointless to be doing research without knowing what's valued by patients, right? Who are we to say what outcomes are most important or what's a meaningful difference in outcomes or which intervention is too burdensome? And it, it's been very interesting to see FDA strikingly move in this direction. Some of it by the insights that were generated by, by researchers here, by John Bridges when he was here. And it's hard to imagine that this would have happened without PCORI. Um, and this mindset has really influenced me as I work with our precision medicine researchers here at Hopkins, who are clinical researchers and don't really have, have the language to talk about the value of their work to patients. Um, and there's really a striking lack of patient engagement in the precision medicine processes here that I would, I would like to change. And a little bit, I wonder if, if PCORI has sort of siloed even patient engagement so that NIH hasn't really stepped into that, that role. And as the funder of most biomedical research, I wonder if, if they feel, if NIH feels that's, that's not so much their obligation and that's, that's trickled down to NIH-funded researchers. 
I don't know, again, a counterfactual. Um, and I would say then in response to, to Joe's last question about other stakeholders, I would say yes, that Medicare and, and Medicaid and payers and legislators um, really are important to other stakeholders and may need as much attention as, as patients if we're working to develop a viable healthcare system where interventions are gonna be delivered you know, at the role of the health system, perhaps through mechanisms other than uh, direct patient to, to clinician interaction. And then uh, my last point is really, uh, oh, oh, this is really hard, right? Hopkins has a goal of making Hopkins easy so we don't burn out and kill ourselves. And I think that has to be a goal of PCORI 2.0. There's a perception among a lot of researchers that PCORI funding may just not be worth it. There are easier ways to get the funding to do impactful research. And I think this is an issue at many stages of the funding process with the, the challenging application process, the engagement of patients throughout the process, uh, the challenging requirements regarding adherence to the methodology standards, the exceptionally detailed reporting requirements and oversight during the conduct of the work, and if all of these steps have been demonstrated to be impactful and improve the process and improve the delivery of the conduct of the work, great, then we should be doing it. But, but we don't know, and, and that's another, another counterfactual because perhaps the investigators would have done this high quality work without, without um, the burden. Um, so I, I think there needs to be a reevaluation because I think PCORI is scaring off researchers who don't have the infrastructure to tackle the process or who just <laughs> don't quite have the energy. Uh, I'm a huge fan of PCORI, relieved and delighted it was renewed. Um, I look forward to the next 10 years and congratulations to, to Joe and to PCORI and thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Jody, and thank you for the uh, following the uh, keep the side simple uh, <laughs> mantra. You've succeeded like no one I've ever seen before. <laughs> um, to you, Liz. Great. Um, I, and I do have some slides too that I'm going to pull up, but I promise to make them make my comments quick uh, so that we can have time for discussion and question and comments. A couple of my themes are actually pretty consistent with Mark, some of what Mark and Jody were saying. Um, and not surprisingly, mostly I wanna focus on the sort of methods angle, um, sort of congrats to PCORI, uh, the value of the support for the methods work that PCORI has, has really uh, led. And then this, one of the themes that Mark brought up, but more from a method side of sort of this opportunity for using PCORI for sort of these conversations about study design and methods. Um, so I can probably skip this. This was uh, just, yeah, sort of my perspective comes mostly from my time on the clinical trials advisory panel, although surprisingly and not surprisingly, confusingly, it also is called the advisory panel on clinical trials. And I was never sure about the actual name. Um, but one of the things I, that I wanted to highlight about this and part of the reason I put this picture, this is the current um, panel or recent panel, not when I served. Um, but it really was a very diverse um, group of people in terms of the perspectives. Um, and I'll come back to that uh, in a minute, um, in particular, sort of this back to this kind of discussion that Mark alluded to in terms of pragmatic trials, as well as non-experimental study designs and sort of some of the thinking about how to think through those trade-offs. Um, but I really wanted to um, sort of, again, just really emphasize this hasn't been a theme yet so far today, but one of the really unique things about PCORI has been their real um, strong support for methodological work. Um, this has included sort of the methodology standards um, and this idea of sort of having these minimum standards that all studies have to meet. Um, and then a lot of efforts to disseminate those to broad groups of researchers, um, including the curriculum that Jody and others at our uh, university led um, and sort of really trying to get that communication out. Um, as Jody alluded to, though, I think this has led to some challenges because my take is that sometimes sort of this desire to bring in a broader set of researchers and sort of bring them up to speed in terms of core methodology information led to then a need to have more oversight um, and sort of a lot of structure and oversight for ongoing projects. Um, and that has, I think, led to challenges and again, sort of as Jody alluded to, 
a lot of burden on researchers and then some people who sort of just decide not to not to go uh, for PCORI funding because of the additional structures put in place. So it's sort of this this trouble, this challenge of sort of bringing in a broader set of researchers while also though not sort of micromanaging and trying to find that balance. Um, importantly though, PCORI though has also um, been a great supporter of methods projects. And this is incredibly rare. Um, NIH has some funding for methods, but usually not sort of set aside funds. Um, and I'm super curious how methods research ended up as one of the first five priority areas and huge kudos to whoever mm -hmm. um, made that happen. And I think in part, I, it's important because it, it sets this infrastructure, sort of it's a type of infrastructure that the methods advances that are made and the efforts towards dissemination of those methods um, can then really support a whole variety of projects. And then again, I just wanted to highlight one of Mark's points about PCORI serving as a really wonderful forum for nuanced conversation. So the CTAP had, again, this incredible diversity. So we had robust conversations, for example, with Bob Temple from FDA, arguing strongly for only a clean randomized trial with validated endpoints and sort of very regulatory trial focused. And then Merrick Warrenstein there on the sort of as a big supporter of pragmatic trials. And it led to, I think, really important conversations about the pros and cons of different study designs um, with implications for the ongoing project. So in the in sort of practice, like what does this look like? I personally would have loved if those conversations could have included some of the things Mark was alluding to about non-experimental designs um, within the purview of the CTAP that didn't happen. But um, I think PCORI in general can facilitate those, um, again, sort of really careful thought and conversation about what is the right study design for a particular question. Um, so where is PCORI going? Sort of my hope is that it can be a continued place to bring together methodologists of all sorts and substantive experts to sort of noodle around complex issues. Um, again, I do think a challenge is finding ways to balance the sort of project oversight with reduced burden on investigators. Um, I really hope that they can continue funding for methodological research that again, it sort of cross cut specific studies. And sort of then a general theme is that as we heard, you know, it's sort of, there's a tension between funding specific topics because there's an infinite number of CER type questions that can be asked. And I think one additional sort of purpose PCORI can serve is to fund this infrastructure. So things like PCORNet, things like methodological tools, which are not just answering one specific substantive question, clinical question or practice question, but really get to more sort of how do we create um, this infrastructure for research moving forward in ways that will then benefit a whole number of questions. Uh, and I will stop there so that we uh, have at least a few minutes for, for general questions and conversation. Thank you so much, um, and uh, uh, thank you for your thoughtful and, and really well-informed questions. Um, we have some questions, and actually, um, Jill Marsteller asks this. Perhaps it's more to Jill than anyone, but it said, was PCORI intended to fill the gap that was left when the HTA was disbanded? I... Um... Can you hear me? I, yeah. I don't think so. I think that they, um, there was um, just not uh, the environment in, in Congress to um, to think about that. Maybe from somebody like Gail Walensky, there was that thought, but um, it, it wasn't articulated a lot. And certainly cost effectiveness, that part of HTA was not, um, was always proscribed. And, and I think, and I think most people feel that it is, was and is a good idea to separate um, empirical research from cost effectiveness analysis. Jill, what, what HTA do you mean? Um, I was talking about, it seemed like the um, old health technology associate uh, uh, agency that um, remember back in, under Clinton, OTA? basically been OTA, sorry, HTA, yeah. OTA. Um, oh. Had okay, disappeared, yeah. and I was wondering whether we that you know there was this effort to kind of fill that gap when they disappeared. Thanks. Again, I think very good. Uh, I think uh, clinical CER is what they called it, and I think that had sort of achieved a life of its own, a little bit different from traditional HTA, which was you know more. Um, it, it certainly got to costs and cost effectiveness, and, and we weren't we didn't. 
Um, other questions from anyone? We have time for a few or a couple anyway. Joe, I guess uh, I'll um, speak up. I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about how you all managed relationships with commercial stakeholders, uh, since that's such a, a tricky thing in our current sort of environment, um, and uh, how you wrestled with that and how that um, um, has sort of uh, positioned us for the sort of next phase of work coming out of PCORI. Yeah, well, this is a good place for me to remind everyone that I'm not at PCORI any longer, not you know necessarily speaking for PCORI. Uh, I think the early days, there was a fair amount of interaction. Um, and uh, probably as industry saw, um, if, if industry saw that we were moving in that different direction that we've been speaking about, their, their uh, concern about us on the one hand or interest in us on the other, might have waned. We still, you know, we we had um, advice. We had advisory panels, or you know, not standing, but uh, one-time advisory panels with industry uh, a lot around Pacornet. Um, but other than that, when it came to particular CER questions, uh, we would wind up reaching out to them, and we'd have discussions when a question came up. But we didn't have ongoing. Um, you know, we didn't get a lot of questions submitted to us from industry, let's put it that way. And do you feel like there are success stories in terms of uh, commercial entities that are now willing to champion the Institute? Uh, and, uh, or are there uh, companies that, uh, you know, uh, could become sort of uh, adversaries in advancing PCORI's mission? Yeah. I, uh... You know, I, I, I kind of feel like that's a question that, that probably doesn't even make sense for me in the role that I'm not in to even <laughs> change to. Okay, that's fair so, enough. You know, so there's certainly nothing threatening on the horizon. You know, I think it's, it's actually pretty friendly relationships. Okay. We've got a, t a chance for another question perhaps. I was wondering um, if, if anyone had thought, I, I sort of liked this sort of comment about noodling around and agreeing to disagree. And I wonder if um, there's room for a new project, uh, uh, sort of an update, what are a hundred questions that need to be answered? Could we get a group of noodlers together to try to hammer that out? Anyone on the panel? Well, I, you know, I, the, the two worst moments for me of all the years I've been in working in PCORI were the priorities, the broad priorities that they did <clears throat> and the struggle they had over the definition because of the uh, patient-centered outcomes research title. Um, I, I think in the final uh, go of it, um, that that was a dodge, that they, they, they said that they felt there wasn't enough uh, public input into it, but they could have just started where the 100 left off and supplemented it. The, the, uh, the IOM had a little bit of public input, not, not very much, um, but they could have started with it. They didn't have to toss it out. I think without knowing what the agenda is, um, all of us, all the stakeholders can't really tell what's gonna happen in the next four years as far as what we're gonna get answers to. It would send a signal to maybe other funders, to uh, patient groups, to everyone else, that finally after all these years, we might get an answer to this evidence gap, to this one. And so I, I do think that they, I don't know about a hundred, uh, but I don't think that the investigator initiative initiated idea was a success. And I don't think uh, making nothing of that hundred work was a good idea. So doing some form of it over, I don't think it, it's needed to have a hundred of them, but I think you could, you, could, you could meet your obligations as far as getting vetting from the public and from consumers and patients, um, but still have an idea that over the next few years, we're going to tackle a lot of a lot of these nagging evidence problems that have been going on for years, and we still don't know 
among these AFib treatments, which ones work best. I, I think they should do something along those lines. Anybody else? Jody, Liz, Joe? Well, I just want to take this opportunity to thank the three panelists. I found your comments really just uh, uh, as, as you, I can't remember the word you used, Albert, but they were really uh, uh, engrossing. And, and um, uh, one that Mark mentioned, I think, uh, I almost said it myself, and I think it shouldn't go unsaid, is that Victoria is really going to play that kind of role of being a rather quick to the table to help identify pressing CER questions when they arise, they just need to have stronger relationships with those stakeholders, mainly Medicare, Medicaid, perhaps the FDA, so that um, this can be done in a coordinated effort. The fact that Corey's not part of HHS is, I think, part of why that didn't happen despite our efforts. But all three of you have fabulous comments. I will take them back to uh, uh, Nikayla at Corey and encourage you, if you haven't worked with her yet, um, get uh, aim to get to know her. It's hard to do in the COVID days, but um, great person. That's great advice. Um, I think we're going to wrap up. So let me conclude, first of all, by thanking all of our panelists um, who really gave provocative and thoughtful comments, uh, not just Pablum. Um, I, I really am grateful to you. Um, thanks, of course, to Joe. Um, you know, I think that we all owe you a lot. Uh, when I took over running this center in about 2012, we more or less stated the goal that we were going to be the PCORI PCOR center at Johns Hopkins um, and, uh, you know, try to monopolize uh, uh, proposals and funded projects. And we did get about 15 projects funded in the first year and a half. Um, and I think in some ways we help teach the institution, you know, how to do it. Well, PCORI research or PCOR has really gone mainstream. I think many of our colleagues are doing, uh, you know, a great job, uh, you know, within Hopkins and outside of Hopkins. Um, but I think that PCORI has re-educated us to some extent, as Jody was saying, about what clinical research should be, or at least that we should be broader about than we, than we were, you know, originally back in the day. So um, I think a lot of, Joe, I think that you're responsible for um, a lot of that. And I'm very grateful that you agreed to join us today. I think that, you know, we are the Health Services and Outcomes Research Center here at Johns Hopkins, uh, continuing Sam's tradition. And um, I think we have, you've left us with things to think about and uh, maybe we will I have to follow up with uh, follow up with you, and take you up on the suggestion of uh, hammering on Nikayla's door. So thank you, Great. thank you all for Thanks participating and hanging in for two hours. Thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Take care. Albert. Albert? Yes. Albert, can you still hear me? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to send you a revised slide deck just in case you want to share with anybody. You should feel welcome to share it. Um, you'll have the recording too, so I guess that's another way to have it. Um, yeah, but I'd love, please do. That that would be fantastic. It's a little different than the one I sent you yesterday. Oh, okay, and we will, yeah, I did, I did notice a change or two, and uh, we will definitely share. Okay, good. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye, Mark. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Bye. Mary. Mary, are you there? I made you co-host. And um, the recording should go to the cloud.